Well, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the live show this evening. Uh, this is Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron. I'm, I'm your guest host for the evening. Um, on my far left on the end, I have Mark Olson. Uh, next to Mark, I have his lovely wife, Pamela Olson. Uh, and on my right, I have their son, Mike. No, I have Mike Giles uh, on the right. And um, I'm going to do a very brief intro of ourselves so I don't have to memorize all this stuff. I cheated. See, I'm going to have people talk about themselves. Um, I currently work um, as a fundraiser for Pacific Legal Foundation, defending the Constitution of the United States, um, basically against government agencies. Uh, and I came to this job as a late life labor of love because of my love of liberty. And I learned at a very early age when I was introduced to Ayn Rand and others, uh, objectivist philosophers who later this all kind of morphed into the idea of libertarianism. And um, so I, I work um, basically following my principles. And um, that's why I'm here, folks, so that we can, uh, libertarians like to keep the government in line and so the people I work for. My opinions, the ones I express, are my own and not the organization that I work for. I want to make that very clear. And um, Mark, tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now and, and how you came to the Liberty Movement. Okay, what I'm doing right now is uh, running the Olson Foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's so making families stronger, taking care of uh, these kids that are growing up without a full family, mother mm -hmm. and father, and make sure they get integrated in society and become productive members. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm also a uh, state licensed contractor. Uh, heating air conditioning refrigeration, so I do that as well. And coming to the Libertarian Party, having about the WikiLeaks dump, mm -hmm. Julian Assange himself. And after that came out, started going We're through it all. We're going to talk about that, folks. Started yeah. going through all that and said, oh man, you know, so came to the Libertarian Party. Cool. Pamela, Mrs. Olson. Yes. How Mr. did you, Cameron. what are you doing now? And um, how did you come to the Libertarian Party? Well, group? thank you for having us this evening. It's always a pleasure to be here at Libertarian Counterpoint with so many great friends. Um, I came to the Libertarian Movement by meeting Dr. Welter and Mr. Giles, and I found that uh, my proclivities within my ideological, the California GOP, the party that loves to lose, uh, was not meeting my needs anymore. I found that the Liberty Movement gave a closer, if not standing right upon, true constitutional principles, and that attracted me, especially now as a retired medical and mental health provider, educator, and now the founder of Save Our Children and we, like the Pacific Legal Foundation, go after those uh, local government entities that go after our children and their families. Okay, cool, thank you so much. And Mike Giles, who's not really their son, by the way, so I was, so I was just being <laughs> Yeah, he's time travel, psychologically. Um, yeah, well, um, I went through college, became an um, educator, and um, started looking around and noticing things weren't working the way we kind of all had hoped and we imagined. And so I started looking around and um, it was a painful move to leave the Democratic Party because it was so emotionally con you know, um, built right into me. Mm -hmm. Very, very painful. But once I did, um, it helped me that Hillary called um, the girls that um, Bill sexually abused trailer trash because mm -hmm. I grew up in a poor area, and those kids were not trailer trash mm. where I grew up. Oh, well, they were Bill Clinton. They Bill Clinton grew up in a mobile home park. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, so imagine uh, that. So anyway, uh, that I, I traveled, and then I met this incredible heroic gentleman known as Dr. Lee Welter. Mm. And uh, if you could see, he's actually sitting behind one of the cameras. Now, oh, folks, but oh, since he, he can't is. train the camera on himself. <laughs> Okay. We'll just we'll just bow to him for his wisdom. <laughs> He's and, a hero. Oh, you got mm. props twice. <laughs> and, anyway, uh, so that's that's how I made yeah. my moves. All right. Well, cool. Now we uh, we're actually going to talk about. Apologize for this white here. We usually have buff colored paper, but we we don't this evening. In the future, we will. I almost promise that. Um, there was a, a nice uh, article, I think in, was it Reason? Uh, that said the, it's the Assange ex exception to the First Amendment. And you know, basically, uh, Mr. Assange is being um, prosecuted for something that isn't a crime. He published information uh, that was uh, secret. And, uh, but journalists do this all the time. 
And what's what's scary is the lamestream media. We don't call them mainstream anymore because they're lamestream, or or the mouthpiece for the deep state or whatever you want to call them. Uh, think that somehow if they work for you know the Wall Street Journal, although Wall Street Journal didn't say this, that they are somehow protected by the Constitution of the United States. But someone who posts stuff on the web is not. So let's throw that out there. Is um, should uh, Mr. Assange be treated differently than, than other journalists because he doesn't work for the New York Times or something like that? <laughs> Who's going to answer? Who, Pamela, what do you think? I would I'm chomping at the bit. Um, every single one of us has inalienable, God-given right to free speech, whether you live in America or not. Mr. Mm -hmm. Assange, even though the journalistic society may not envelop him and embrace him and find him an adulterer within journalistic purviews and policies, the man has absolutely awakened this nation and created a, uh, a stopgap from what was being constantly fed through the TV, the idiot box, as my grandmother always called it. Um, it literally is waking oh, wait, wait, people up. We're on up. TV. Selectively, TV can be very, very educational yep. and liberating. <laughs> yes. Now let's go on. Okay. Normally, <laughs> it's an idiot box, just not this show. So go ahead. Pam. Even when I do Facebook Lives, workshops on um, how, a, a, per se, a family law procedural court works, mm -hmm. because it doesn't look like Law and Order, does it? It doesn't mm -hmm. look like Perry Mason, does it? So mm -hmm. parents are really confused when they walk into these family law courts or JDC courts. As you break it down, I'm on camera, I'm speaking to people I cannot see, and I'm not a journalist. Does that make what I am sharing in the absolute truth of the information, does it make it any less? Mm -hmm. No. So I absolutely have every right, just as Assange, or those in the lamestream media, each of them have their own opinion. Doesn't make the freedom of speech any less important. Mm -hmm. So you, you said, uh, in this country, open the eyes. I think it uh, opened the eyes of a lot of people around the world, too, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. As long as you can, you can keep things uh, behind the curtain and, mm -hmm. and you know, the shell game and, and mm -hmm. uh, keep the lies going, then that's fine. Now, there are some people who say that Mr. Assange, uh, by publishing some of this information, put, um, put uh, our secret allies in foreign countries and some, some government agencies, agents at risk who work for the CIA or the NSA or all the rest of that. You know, my response to that would be, if that's the case, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, nobody has shown me yet um, a specific a single incident where, where that's happened. They say in the generality. Mm -hmm. And my second point on this would be, what are we doing with secret agents in these countries trying to mess with other people's governments and do foreign policy under the, under the cover of darkness. I mean, what are we doing there? If we weren't there, he would have nothing to reveal. So, um, and, and I'm, you know, if anybody died, got killed, you know, had to move, um, I'm sorry about well, that. And, and but, let's point you know, out the obvious dichotomy. If Julian Assange was a Republican and what he was dumping was Republican or conservative members' emails, information, instead of what was revolved in, in, in Vault 7, jaws dropped in many different areas on many different topics, we would have a completely different look, or at least the lamestream media, we have a completely different work. He would be a hero for revealing mm. those evil Republicans have done it again. <laughs> So, quite literally, it, it depends on their perspective. So their perspective right now, as we've been so far left, to me, has absolutely no bearing, and they absolutely have no voice. What do you think, Mark? I think that the uh, liberals should be having a field day because uh, he let everything out. Mm -hmm. So they should be happy and jump them down and be totally glad. Mm -hmm. and, but they're going both ways. They want it both ways. Mm -hmm. you know, they want their secrets, mm -hmm. you know, and then they want everybody to know, too. Mm -hmm. Selectively, that if yeah. it's a Trump secret, let's spread it out for all the world to see. But if it's uh, Hillary oh, selling uh, visits to the State Department to the sure. highest bidder, my first reaction when I heard all this was like, ah, no, he let it all out. What's he doing? You know, mm -hmm. they should hang this guy. You know, he's a traitor. You know, mm -hmm. he just threw us under the bus. You know, the government needs to have their secrets. You know, mm -hmm. so they can keep us safe. Mm -hmm. Right? That's where I was. Okay. After I uh, 
hold my head out of the sand. <laughs> it, it made more you know sense. Like, wait a minute, you know, this guy did us a favor, you know, because we need to know all these things that are going on because our government's running off, doing things we don't want them doing, and getting into messes we don't want them getting into. Yeah, Mr. Giles, it, absolutely correct. I mean, <clears throat> just like you, at first I was, oh, what, what's he doing? You know, you know, getting them, you know, secret secrets out, but then with the Mueller investigation and other things, we're starting to open up and see this, um, you know, the word deep state or the mm -hmm. DC swamp, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. All these people are making so much money on all these secret deals and globalist efforts and all that. And they're, they're making billions of dollars, mm -hmm. hundreds of billions of dollars on a yearly basis. So they don't want us to know all their secrets. Mm -hmm. And I'll just throw in that since all that kind of stuff started happening, also, there was a, um, what our CIA does, according to a, view, a policeman viewing the tape that I'm gonna just mention here briefly, he said, this is just like the CIA kill stops that they mm -hmm. do in other nations. And that's the state-sponsored murder of LaVoy Finnicum up oh. near Burns, Oregon. Mm -hmm. they, they ran him off the road and he was shot from three sides. Um, and uh, so, and they said, this is, this is a standard kill stop. And so, well, if it our, our was done in South America and he was disappeared, then, you know, it would be a bad thing. But if it's done on camera here, yeah. it's a good thing? I mean, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't get that. Isn't that the same family that was, um, didn't they put those people in prison for terrorism? For some of those people for, for um, starting a fire as a backfire to prevent their, their holdings from being burned to the ground. That and somehow mm -hmm. they went through one of their kangaroo courts, and these are my opinions, folks, nobody else's, and managed to convict these people of terrorism? How did they make that leap? Uh, I would think that, that uh, flying a drone and you know missiles into somebody's home and killing them on another sovereign nation would be terrorism but mm -hmm. lighting a fire to to protect your own home anyway so uh, you know i guess it, it just depends on your point of view so uh, but the thing that's upset me again and i know we're going a little long on this one but i think it's hugely important is that uh, some of the lamestream media have said that, no, he's not really a journalist. He doesn't have the same First Amendment protections that we do. <laughs> our little so, group. So, yeah. yeah, our little group. All right, so. Um, well, they, and, yeah, they went to school and they got their uh, license, right? Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and their yeah. permits. Got and their journalism their, degree. Yeah, right. Huh. All right, so uh, in, in, um, in India, is it in India? Mm -hmm. uh, Apple and Google, and I wish we'd have actually thrown in um, Facebook uh, censoring uh, uh, right-wing organizations. When are they going to? When are they going to censor left-wing uh, hate speech, folks? Mm. Uh, but um, Never. so Apple and Google blocked this video video sharing company in India called TikTok, and they say they're blocking it because underage kids are putting videos up and it's a front for prostitution and there's pornography on it and blah 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 blah. So um, you know if underage kids are being taken advantage of anywhere uh, I got a gun tell me I'll go help them out. Um, if they'll let me actually fly somewhere with it, which, which they won't. Um, I'm, not, I'm not promoting that kind of behavior so the, I guess the question I want to ask is this is Apple and, and Google are private companies, and and um, do they not have the right as private companies to decide what they carry on their property, which is their websites? Um, part of me says, sure they do. Uh, you know, like uh, the local cable provider is is huge. Um, I think it's Comcast here in in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. um, if they've got the pipeline, shouldn't they be able to control or charge more or less for what goes down? That's part of me. The other side of me feels that this smacks of uh, censorship. So what does everybody think? Uh, Pamela, what do you think? Well, censorship or, or, or is it, does a private company have the right to do this or? Yes and no. Okay. Yeah, I, that's my, I'm kind of yes I, and no I, I on this one myself. Yeah. One, I don't want to see any child harmed. Yeah. Social platforms go way beyond Apple and Google. Facebook, they actually have groups of predators. Mm -hmm. They won't remove them, but they'll silence libertarian or conservative speech. Mm -hmm. YouTube, 
their actual pedophilic YouTube videos that they won't take down. But the minute you start talking about the positivity of an economy that is blooming again, almost unseen since Reagan, you're shut down. And that video is, is taken down and deleted. Mm. Okay. So I understand we're being silenced. When you have TikTok, which is a Chinese app, it was made in China by oh, Chinese developers. Okay. A madrasa in India, a madrasa court, which is a religious high court, is asking two large companies in America to take down this app from India so it can't be used. So we've got a Chinese developer, we've got a madras in India making the mandate, and then we've got two American companies. If I'm an American company, I don't really care what China and India think, whether they're our allies or not. If I'm finding out that there are predators, pornography, and other things that my app is not used for, I'm going to be responsible and take those things down. So the madrasa should be turning on China and say, clean up your app or we're going to keep your app from being in India. That should be between the madras and China. It should have nothing to do with two private American companies. Okay, anybody else? Well, right here, censorship. I'm, I'm with you too. It's a censorship in the name of morality. That's what they're trying to do. And uh, they should be able to put up whatever they want to. Okay, whatever they want to, no matter what it is. Okay, it's up to the viewer if you're viewing it. Okay, if you order up this video, whatever it is, okay, you should have to type in your name or a code or something mm -hmm. and they charge you more so you can see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we can put you on a list. Mm -hmm. And know where who you are, and then you could hop on that plane and bring along your gun. And <laughs> you feel kind of like you were talking about. I was joking about. Well, not really, but I'm not <laughs> promising to shoot, nor even hinting that I would. Um, so this is this is a tough area. You know, libertarian part of me um, really loves the idea of of, of open, um, basically open content anywhere, and kind of let the buyer beware. I mean, in in in, in good families. Mothers and fathers know what their children are doing. They instill certain moral precepts in them, and they don't go to websites that are that are putting holes in their brain. And they do go to places where they can learn and interact with people. Gosh, you know what? I think it's my fault that we're spending all this time talking on the show. Yeah, you're, so you're talking. <laughs> we need to we need to jump into the next thing because this is a huge, and I think we're going to spend. Uh, I'd love to talk about one more case, but I think we're going to spend an awful lot of time talking and just kind of meld us all together about schools. So so here's the question, um, and I wish I had the quote. There's there's a um, an early kind of founder libertarian woman uh, movement, a woman, one of the three founding women of. There's Ayn Rand and two others, and I'm sure if Lee was, Lee's got this quote down pat, but he can't talk because he's behind the camera. And she said basically in essence, um, and I'm paraphrasing, that, that uh, um, basically dictatorial power, the very definition of it is if you, if a government <clears throat> takes your children from um, your home and puts them into government schools and teaches them what the government wants them to learn and then takes money from you to pay for this, it's the worst kind of worst kind of overreach. So based on that, I'm just going to say government school, let's not call them public schools because they're definitely not public, they're government schools, versus private or open education or all the rest of that. Which one's better? Well. Uh, I'll just throw in that um, stunned I was some years back to read letters written by soldiers in the Civil War. And the, the, the kind of the meter and the case and the description and seeing everything around them, it was so elevated. These were sixth, seventh, eighth grade graduates of schools in those days that most college kids couldn't write anything like that now. And it just shocked me. I did a little bit more research and I saw found something from Nebraska in the 1870s. Kids, high school kids, for, for getting into the seventh grade, I think, or uh, being allowed into the seventh grade, it was stunning what they had to know. Mm. And so schools at one time, and my dad could tell me directly about it, were run by local communities. And the teachers moved from place to place to live because they didn't pay them very much and the families would host them. 
and the level of education was intensely much higher. Mm -hmm. and there's a, there, and I'll second that. There's a Canadian study that finds that homeschool kids are smarter than public school students. Public school kids test at, at or above uh, grade level students from a structured homeschool test well above that. You know, and you can say, well, people at home school have, they're typically upper middle class, they have someone who can stay at home and teach, they're, the, the kids are, you know, basically they're saying from a better gene pool. Um, but I'm thinking that, that when we mentioned this on the other, earlier show, uh, well, actually it's a later show, you'll have to tune into the <laughs> show on the 25th as well to get all of this, folks, that um, really what public schools are, especially in the state of California, and I know a number of teachers who are, who are driven to provide as good of education to, to kids as they possibly can. They're prevented from yes. doing it. Yeah. But there, there's something that goes into this, and that's the myth of the underpaid mm -hmm. public school teacher. And so I want to talk about that briefly, and maybe this puts this whole subject into a little bit of perspective. Uh, the average uh, public school teacher in the state of California makes sixty-seven thousand eight hundred seventy-one dollars a year, but it's not really for a year, folks. That's for one hundred and eighty-one days of work, and according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and these people spend a lot of our money making sure these numbers are accurate. The average teacher works seven and a quarter hours a day during those one hundred and eighty-one days. There are some who work. 10 hour days, but there's others who basically sit and read while their kids are reading or play video games. So it all evens out. So that works out to 50 bucks an hour, um, not counting the benefits. And here's a hidden benefit that raises that wage even more. Public school teachers in the state of California don't pay social security tax, which is, what is it, eight and a quarter percent on every dollar of your wage now? Wow. So you multiply the eight and a quarter percent times the 67871 that's additional $5,000 a year in their pockets that, that if we're not teachers, we have to pay. So it actually ends up being about $55 an hour. That doesn't count the outstanding benefits. So that's executive wages, ladies and gentlemen. That's not managerial wages. That's executive wages. But let's not leave out our substitute teachers and our brand new teachers coming out of college. Mm -hmm. Our eldest, full disclosure, our eldest is a teacher. She tried for five years. She was a substitute teacher for five years. She's an excellent teacher. She could not get in because no union, public school union worker, teacher, would leave their position, even though they were already tenured and you were gonna receive your full pension. They won't leave. So my daughter went to a charter school. She loves it. And even though it's less than pay, and she's not a union provider, mm. she has now become the lead teacher and absolutely enjoys this charter school that she's teaching mm. in, and she's adored and has now become the lead teacher. So there are two definite sides, the haves and those that have not yet attained the have. Well, yeah, those me... numbers you came up with, uh, I got something similar. A first year teacher is like 55000 a year. Oh. After they've been here for three years, it's 80000 Where? Here in California. In right. some school districts. I don't think it could yeah. be that high. Here in California. In, in L.A. and in Marin and other places. In Sacramento, it is not. because well, not the, Sacramento. The, I'm talking all of yeah. California. Okay. okay. Plus, they receive an additional 25 to 30% of that in benefits. Mm -hmm. So they get the, the 80 plus another 25%, mm -hmm. which is the benefits, the time off. Yeah, vacation. defined, defined uh, contribution pension plan, which is sure. very rare nowadays unless you're Union member or government? Oh, wait, they're both government and yeah, union. Right. So I want to talk about a case that well, brings to light. Well, hold up just a second. Right. Okay, you're talking about the difference between a private and public. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Pamela went to private school. Mm -hmm. Okay, I went to public. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, our own daughters, uh, we homeschooled them after they did two years of high school. Mm -hmm. They did two years of high school and then they were like, this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all idiots, they're not learning anything. So we finished up educating them ourselves. They uh, graduated a year early. And wow. they were in the college when they were hadn't even turned eighteen yet. Cool. Very I want to talk about one of one of Pacific Legal Foundation's cases very briefly because it's it's uh, racial discrimination against black mm -hmm. children in Connecticut. The uh, Connecticut Parents Union um, versus Wenzel. Um, state law in Connecticut requires that magnet schools enrollment be at least twenty five percent white or Asian. So. And this is the reason this was, was instituted was so that there wouldn't be racial discrimination. Don't tell me how that works, folks, because one Supreme Court justice said very famously, the way you end discrimination is by ending discrimination. Mm -hmm. So what happens is if uh, there aren't 
that 25% white or Asian kids in the class, and there's seats in that class, they sit empty, and mm -hmm. black kids who are doing everything they possibly can to get into this magnet school so they have the opportunity to make something of their life are looking through the window at that empty seat and putting their names in a lottery trying to get into it. And you tell me how that's right, folks, and that's why Pacific Legal Foundation has taken that case. And I'm pretty sure they're going to win because these people are serious about protecting uh -huh. the rights of even children under the Constitution of the United States. So um, I'm doing a time check here. The lights are so bright in this high-tech studio. Sorry about the glare, folks. I didn't put on Mattifier. Um, I think I'm going to start winding it down. We have about two minutes. So it, can anybody, um, is anybody dying to say one thing on a subject that, uh, that we've talked about that they'd like to close on on this show? Mike, well, I'll can you do in, it in a minute? I'll, do, I'll try to be faster than that. <clears throat> Some of my most heroic students have been uh, black students that wanted to learn. And I'm thinking of Ben Carson, whose mother made him learn, gave him every opportunity to learn, and he did. Mm -hmm. And he excelled. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just throw that much in. And you talked about, I think it might have been on the other show, I get so confused this time of night because it's almost my bedtime, that um, these, these bureaucrats and these, and these, these school administrators and, and these people in welfare departments have such loathing and such a low opinion of the people that they're designed to help. It really is racism, isn't it? Yeah. yeah and on that note, yeah. it's racism, folks. And, <laughs> and uh, we're going to try to eliminate it. I want to thank you very, very much for watching Libertarian Counterpoint uh, this evening. So I know we didn't go over um, uh, as many topics as we normally do, but some of these things like First Amendment and, and you know, basically... Um, uh, dooming children to uh, dead-end lives because of uh, the power of unions and, and <coughs> the inability to compete with the public school system um, are important. And so, you know, we want to take a little bit more time. Um, and I want to thank uh, Mark Olson and Pamela Olson and Mike Giles for, for being such uh, lively participants this evening. I want to thank the crew behind the camera. We have this massive crew here, folks. No, it isn't, really. we got people doing three jobs tonight each um, for, for their patience with us and uh, putting the show on. And on that note, uh, please look for us uh, on, uh, I think it's Channel 17 locally, uh, or on um, accesssacramento.org. And uh, on Channel 17, you can see us at 8 o'clock on Thursday. You can see us at uh, noon on Friday, and my favorite time, 4 a.m. Saturday. You betcha I'm up watching the show then, folks. Uh, and you can see it on YouTube uh, about a week uh, after the show comes out. So thank you so very much uh, for, for attending the, the one show on TV that is not an idiot box, Libertarian <laughs> Counterpoint. Have a wonderful evening. Be safe, folks. Take care.